down deep beneath these volcanoes to generate the carbon dioxide you see coming out the top. That links this carbon dioxide to organic sediments way offshore in the ocean. The organic matter that was originally phytoplankton becomes carbon dioxide that we see at the surface. Seafloor sediments are getting into volcanoes, and these sediments contain seawater. This is the water that causes the rocks to melt below the volcanoes, forming magma. But a mystery remains. The magma plumes feeding the volcanoes lie sometimes hundreds of miles from the ocean. The scientists now have to figure out how the sediments loaded with seawater are moving so far inland. To find out, the investigation heads for Alaska's Chugach Mountains. The research here begins with an analysis of the local rocks. Oh, this is a really neat boulder that's right here. And uh, what you can see in it is that there's this whole mixture of rock types. You can see that there's this black stuff, which would originally been mud. There's several different colors of kind of greenish rocks, which would be kind of different flavors of uh, volcanics. So here it looks like there's limestone. And uh, I'm gonna put some acid here, and if it fizzes, it's limestone. Yep, sure enough, that's what it is. And this would have formed in the ocean. And so this is made up of the bodies of little critters. It got incorporated into this rock, and now it's up here in the Chugach Mountains. The presence of jumbled oceanic rocks 20 miles from the sea is evidence that something remarkable is happening at the bottom of the ocean. The fact that you have this mixture of rock types here is evidence for the seafloor moving. Geologists know that only an enormous process called subduction could shift these mixed ocean sediments here. Subduction occurs when the seafloor moves and slides down under the land. As it descends, the top sediment layers are scraped off by the land like a snowplow scoops up snow. They're pushed up into a huge mound of mixed up rocks. The Chugach Mountains were formed in this way. The seafloor, loaded with water, now continues down into the earth. This is how seawater gets deep underground, where it creates the magma plumes that build the Ring of Fire's explosive volcanoes. Where we're at right now, the Pacific is subducting beneath us to the northwest uh, at this northern part of the Ring of Fire. It's about 20 miles beneath our feet right here. But if we were to go off that way where the volcanoes are, it's about 60 miles beneath our feet there. And so as it goes to the northwest, it subducts and then uh, brings water and sediment into the earth. That uh, ends up uh, causing melting in the mantle. And then that melt rises as magma uh, to volcanoes. The investigation to discover how water is getting down below Ring of Fire volcanoes has turned up intriguing clues. Carbon-12 samples indicating that ocean sediments are getting deep below the Ring of Fire's volcanoes. And mixed rocks in the Chugach Mountains, 20 miles inland from the ocean, are evidence that the whole seafloor is on the move, sliding deep under the land. This process is the engine that powers the Ring of Fire's killer volcanoes. But deep underground, the Ring of Fire hides another, even more deadly secret. Earthquakes that can destroy entire cities. The Ring of Fire, a lethal line of volcanoes. 75% of all the volcanoes on the planet these fiery peaks encircling the Pacific Ocean are built by tremendous forces deep in the Earth. Eruptions here have taken many thousands of lives and destroyed billions of dollars of property. But an even bigger killer is present on the Ring of Fire. Earthquakes. 
90% of the world's quakes occur in this narrow band around the Pacific, often with disastrous results. Sumatra, September 2009. A giant earthquake left more than 1,000 people dead. Mexico, September 1985. More than 9,000 people were killed by a massive magnitude 8 quake that shook Mexico City. And Alaska, March 1964. North America's greatest ever recorded earthquake near Anchorage. This quake was so powerful, ground movements were observed 4,000 miles away in Florida. Such awesome power drives scientists on to discover why these deadly quakes occur all around the Ring of Fire. The investigation moves to Prince William Sound, 36 miles from the epicenter of the 1964 Alaskan disaster. We're at the uh, northern edge of the Ring of Fire, and we're gonna be looking at uh, evidence for how geologically active this area is today. Poisler heads for Montague Island, a place that's permanently scarred by the powerful forces which shape this entire region. On land, he finds a rugged, boulder-strewn shoreline. So you can see we're at the edge of the ocean. We're in a high-energy environment. There's boulders all over the place. And we're at the top of the beach. Waves have been crashing here and basically getting rid of the little tiny rocks, leaving only boulders behind. And then right here, you can see that these boulders are kind of lined up against each other like dominoes. And so it takes big waves to uh, sort of uh, flip these over and line them up kind of like dominoes like that right here. But it's not this rocky beach that reveals how violent Ring of Fire quakes can be. The real evidence lies one quarter of a mile inland. Poisler hunts through the thick undergrowth. Hidden by the trees is a near identical line of boulders. Uh, we've hiked in, uh, thrashed through the, the alders, uh, the Alaskan jungle up to here. Uh, we're probably 25 or 30 feet above sea level at this point. And what we have here is a beach. I mean, this is basically a perfectly preserved, high energy beach environment, like we were looking at down on the shoreline. And you can see here, once again, there's these big boulders that are uh, sort of laid over in this domino-like fashion. Uh, sort of pointing uphill as a result of this big wave energy, big waves pounding on the beach, flipping the boulders over, pointing in the uphill direction. This inland raised shoreline runs for hundreds of yards, parallel with the ocean. It's a key piece of evidence, and it can only mean one thing. The land itself must have recently risen up out of the ocean, taking the entire shoreline with it. It means that there was an event that was essentially an instant in which this region was uplifted to this elevation and uh, made this here. This, all, this has to have been uh, a result of a big earthquake. Really cool. What we're looking at here is a result of the 1964 Great Alaska Earthquake. Pretty much right here where we're at is where there was the largest uplift that occurred. The massive earthquake here not only lifted the land out of the sea, it also caused a wave of destruction, devastating nearby Anchorage. It was a magnitude 9.2. It was the second largest earthquake ever recorded on Earth. It was just enormous lasted four and a half minutes of ground shaking. What happened throughout this region offers evidence of the type of quake that makes the Ring of Fire so dangerous. So we know from this kind of earthquake that occurred here in 1964 that this was a thrust type earthquake or even there was a fancy term mega thrust earthquake because it was so big that occurred right here. And this is a result of the slippage of one piece of rock over another, or one underneath the other. Megathrust quakes like this are the most powerful on Earth and are one of the great dangers of the Ring of Fire. 
If they occur under the ocean, they can generate killer waves called tsunamis. The Great Alaskan Earthquake of 1964 caused a tsunami over 200 feet high. Waves traveled over 1,700 miles, claiming lives as far away as California. But this disaster was nothing compared to what happened in 2004. On December 26th, tragedy struck when an enormous underwater megathrust earthquake off the Asian coast generated monster waves. The coastlines of 14 countries were swamped, killing more than 200,000 people. The vast scale of this disaster was a brutal indication of the power of megathrust earthquakes. And it's given urgency to finding out why these quakes happen all around the Ring of Fire. Once again, the Alaskan landscape is the perfect geological laboratory. So we're headed to a seismic station in south central Alaska near the tip of the Kenai Peninsula. Millions of years of the Ring of Fire's volcanic activity and rippling earthquakes have given Alaska an incredibly rugged landscape. It's not easy to find a flat spot to land. Clear on my side. High on the hillside lies West's seismic station, protected under the yellow cover from the elements and the local bears. So this is the vault where one of our seismic stations lives. This is one of the many seismic stations that dot the state of Alaska. Several thousand seismic stations like this exist, all the way from Alaska down to California. And this whole system together monitors any kind of seismic activity, any sort of earthquakes throughout this whole area. It's part of a whole network on all of the volcanoes around here, on the mainland, and throughout this whole area. So the seismic data can be used not only to judge the severity of the earthquake, or the, the magnitude, but also when taken across a number of stations to pinpoint the location of that earthquake. In Alaska, we're looking at about 1,500 earthquakes every month. And you take all of those together and you start to see patterns. They, they map out a ribbon of earthquake activity that follows all along the coast. This ribbon of earthquake activity extends all around the Ring of Fire. But it is what scientists can see below the surface that is most revealing. If you look at it from the side, you see that actually the earthquakes that are happening close to the ocean tend to be shallow, but as you go inland, they're deeper. And they create this dipping feature that uh, starts out uh, in the ocean and then dips down beneath the continent. This giant dipping feature provides conclusive evidence for how the megathrust earthquakes are generated. The earthquake epicenters exactly follow the path taken by the seafloor as it moves down underneath the volcanoes. Earthquakes are triggered as the rocks slide past each other down into the earth. It is this subduction of the seafloor beneath the land which creates the Ring of Fire's lethal megathrust quakes and builds its explosive stratovolcanoes. So all of these observations, the volcanoes, the line of seismic activity, the big earthquakes at the interface, all of those are part of one system. They all tie together and are interrelated. The investigation into why the Ring of Fire is prone to such lethal earthquakes reveals a raised shoreline, evidence that the Ring of Fire suffers the most violent megathrust earthquake.